Welcome to Tech to Tech presented by Kaizen, where we will explore common cleaning questions and answers. This session has been pre recorded and will include additional FAQs related to this specific topic at the end of the presentation. We hope it is 15 minutes well spent. Let's get started. I'd like to introduce Kaizen Zone, Marco Navialich. Thanks, William. Hello, everyone. I'd like to thank you for taking the time out of your day to spend with me to go over our today's topic. Today, we'll be covering the vacuum degreasing process. We will briefly go over the basics of how this process works. And then more specifically, we will focus on the risk coming with acid formation during this type of process, how to control it, and what steps to take to prevent it. I will show you how to, on a regular basis, check if there is any acid forming in your system. And finally, what can you do about it and prevent it from happening? So let's just quickly start with the basics of how these systems operate. Uh, the machine basically is a fully closed system where the parts are placed in the chamber. Once the parts are in, the chamber is closed and vacuum is pulled on the entire system. This isolates the process from the operator and the environment. You typically have two wash tanks. You can have three also, depending on the machine itself. You have a still, a condenser, and a water separator. Optionally, you can also have an RP tank for corrosion protection and an oil separator. Once the vacuum is pulled, you can then start filling the solvent from flood tank one and perform the cleaning process, which can be any combination of ultrasonics, uh, immersion, or spraying process. Then you would do the same from flood tank two and optionally flood tank three. After that, you can do a vapor phase step, which is going to rinse the parts. And finally, you have the vacuum drying step at the end to dry the parts. During the entire time, the solvent is being distilled in the still, where due to the difference in boiling points uh, of the solvent and the oils, the oils will remain in the still, and the clean solvent will evaporate, condense back to liquid form in the condenser, and then return back to the tank it always returns back to the cleanest tank, which is the last one. And thanks to this distillation process, we are constantly recycling and reusing the same solvent. And thanks to the system being under vacuum, the consumption of these systems is very low, which makes the whole process very efficient. If you would like to get to know the vacuum degreasing process itself in more detail, I would advise you to visit our tech to tech page and check out our previous sessions focusing more specifically on the vacuum degreasing process itself. So let's now focus on some of the things uh, you need to watch out for in this type of process. Uh, one of them being the risk of acid starting to form inside the machine. So how can this acid start to form? First of all, our solvent, which can be modified alcohol or hydrocarbon, will not turn acidic themselves. Then what can affect the stability of the solvent? So it is actually affected over time by the soils we are introducing in the machine. The most critical soil to watch out for is our chlorinated oils. Uh, these oils are commonly used in uh, metal forming operations which, ha which have heavy constraints. They react with the surface under high temperature and pressure and they provide maximum lubrication. And while they're excellent lubricant additives, they can be very difficult to remove. These chlorides can typ typically be found in screw machines, uh, stamping and drawing oils, and many other uh, metalworking processes. In addition uh, to the chlorinated oils, the oil industry has also moved to sulfonated oils in order to compensate for the machining properties that the chlorine additives provide. The term sulfonated oils is applied to a group of compounds uh, arising from the action of sulfuric acid and an oil. So what causes acid to start forming in the machine? It is actually a combination of uh, those chlorides uh, in chlorinated or sulfonated oils, uh, heat of the process itself, and water accumulation in the machine. This salt will start the reactive process. This process can then cause the breakdown of these materials, and when they start to break down, they will combine with the hydrogen from the water molecules, and this will cause the hydrochloric acid to form. Sulfonated oils are generally more stable than the chlorinated ones. They pose a lower risk, but still they can also be the source of some problems uh, that come with acid formation, and in this case, we are talking about sulfuric acid. 
especially in some older systems where you do not continuously remove the oils from the machine. Both of these acids have low boiling points. This means they will eventually evaporate from the distillation tank together with the solvent vapors, and they will condense inside the condenser and spread throughout the whole system. So let's now see what are the risks that these acids pose to your system. Uh, hydrochloric acid is actually extremely co corrosive towards stainless steel and copper. Its aggressiveness can change drastically depending on concentration, the temperature, and also the amount of contamination. In general, stainless steels cannot tolerate uh, very aggressive hydrochloric solutions. This hydrochloric acid is substantially more harmful than sulfuric acid for stainless steel, but both of them can cause problems with corrosion. Uh, the other material often used nowadays in machines is copper. Uh, it is very prone to corrosion also in hydrochloric acid solutions. Uh, these acids can then corrode your heat exchanger, uh, but also the vacuum pump, which is the most e expensive part uh, of your machine. And over time, acidic corrosion can also cause a small, small air leak in the system. This will cause the vacuum pump to work much harder and for much longer periods of time. And if this is not controlled and treated in time, this will burn out the vacuum pump and cause it to fail, which will, of course, result in a very costly repair to the machine. Because of this, you would need to control and keep in check the formation of these acids. Otherwise, it can cause harm to any surface in the machine it touches. So what I want to show you next is how can you check on a regular basis if there are any acids forming in the machine. Uh, there are quick and easy tests developed to monitor the solvent, and basically how they work is uh, they try to force out all that acid out of the solvent and into a water layer, and then measure to see if the pH of the water drops. If it does, this means that there is acid present. What you will need for this test is a plastic sample bottle, a sample of the solvent from the machine, some sodium hydroxide, water, and pH indicator strips. You will start by taking out a sample of the solvent from the machine. You will mix it with a predetermined amount of sodium hydroxide and water. You will then put a pH indicator strip inside the bottle, close it, shake it, and mix well in order to give time for the indicator strip to react with this mixture. And after you mix it, open up the bottle and take out the strip and check for a color change. So if the strip shows yellow or orange color, this means that we have acid present in the solvent. And if that is the case, we would need to start neutralizing the acid. We do this by adding a drop of the acid neutralizer into the sample bottle one by one. After each drop we add to the mixture, we put a new pH indicator strip inside, close the bottle, shake it again, and again check for the color change. The target colors we want to see are green or blue, if you see green color, this means that no acidic soils are present in the solvent. If you see blue color, this tells us that there is enough acid neutralizer already present in the mix. And both of these colors mean that there is no further action, action necessary. So when we start seeing those two colors on the pH strip, this means that we have added enough of the acid stabilizer and what we need to do next is to do some simple math or just simply go to our conversion chart and then you can determine how much of this acid stabilizer you need to add to the machine this is calculated based on the total system volume and the number of drops of the acid stabilizer you added pre in previous steps once you know the amount of the acid stabilizer necessary you add that amount to the machine and it will spread throughout the whole system, neutralizing any acids which started to form in the machine. Lastly, I want to touch on some frequently asked questions and best practices on the testing process itself. Firstly, often people ask where in the machine to take the sample of the solvent from. I always try to take the sample from the point closest to the condenser. Uh, some machines have a sample port there on the condensing tank, so this would be a good point. Sometimes flood tank 2 would be the closest point where you have a sample port. Or if you do not have any sample ports in the machine, you can also get a sample from the water separator. Last option would also be to simply put an empty beaker in the chamber itself, go into manual mode, flood the chamber from, from uh, flood tank 2, do a vacuum dry step, then open the chamber, take out the beaker, and then you have your solvent sample directly 
from blood tank 2. How much sample do you need? Uh, the test requires 50 milliliters of solvent sample. I would recommend drawing a bit more, so at least 100 milliliters or 200, just in case you would need to redo the test again for any reason. What type of water should you use when mixing with the solvent sample and sodium hydroxide? Does it matter? Actually, it is not crucial. The type and quality of water is really irrelevant. You do not need to use deionized or RO water. You can use any type of water, tap water, bottled water will be good enough because the test is designed to automatically compensate for that. When you determine how much acid neutralizer you need to add to the machine, next question is how and where to add it. What I recommend is to add it directly into the distillation tank, because if you add it there, this way it will take the least amount of time for the acid neutralizer to spread throughout the whole system, because this is what we want, to spread it as quickly and efficiently throughout the whole system as possible. And lastly, how often should you do the test? This largely depends on the type of soil you're cleaning and the amount of this soil you're introducing into your solvent. We recommend in the beginning to do the test more often. So for example, I would recommend doing it every day to make sure that everything is under control. And if you are getting good results and you have everything under control, you, with time you want, might want to spread out those time intervals and do the test less often. And with that, I would like to wrap up this session for today. Thank you everybody for tuning in and I will hand it back over to you, William. Thanks, Marco. And thank you all for watching this tech to tech session. If you would like to discuss this topic further or have any questions not answered in the session, please contact your local Kaizen regional manager or send an email to tech, the number two tech at kaizen.com. And we will have someone follow up with you as soon as possible. Do you want to have exclusive access to future content sent directly to your inbox? Or do you know someone who would benefit from these sessions? If the answer is yes, just go to tech to tech by kaizen.com fill out the subscription form. And if you like this video, be sure to follow us on our social media platforms for more expert cleaning content.